scrubbing around on the internet, YouTube videos, and just looking for that one odd example video for a home network setup because it might apply more to you than say a technical jargon, well stick around because this video might be for you. Now a little bit of background before I go into all these home networking things. I have a background as a sysadmin at a college a long time ago, but I've done so much networking in the last 17 years that my head kind of explodes. So be between the experience at the college, I was working with students, whether it was my friend's students or just students, and they invited me to the house because they needed a wireless setup or a network setup because they didn't care about cabling. That's going to transition on to the next subject, budgeting. First, you want to determine what do you want to spend. Now, wired is going to be the cheapest solution. I personally recommend wired if you don't mind wires around the floor, if you can't drill into the wall, which I'm going to go into a subject about that. Now, wireless will be more prohibitive budget-wise. And honestly... I would say skip everything unless it's the latest N, which is fine, but honestly I think spending a little bit extra on getting AC 1200 minimum is the best solution here. Now with that in mind, I'm going to talk about my current situation in this household, which is a rented house, I live in my parents' basement, I'm their employee, so it's kind of a gray area. Yeah, I could be the butt of all jokes, you could put it down in the comments, any of your jokes. Ah, oh, this guy lives in his parents' basement. He must be a troll. With that in mind, and set aside, in this house is a rented space. I can't drill into the walls because I don't own the home. Now, I don't want to be digging around in these walls because, not just because the basement is, well, more modern than upstairs. This whole home was built in about, I think, the 40s. As my parents told me when they moved in here, there was still cork fuses. But in upstairs wiring, you still have wire and post, which is always fun to work with, even with a mains off you just don't want to touch anything upstairs and that also adds to interference with wireless now with that kind of home situation in mind I can't really exactly string a wire from way over yonder 30 feet away because the studio space next to me is my father's art studio and I respect his work area and that's also the rehearsal area for our music so I can't have all these nice wires just floating floating around the house Nobody likes that around here. Now, that's that's the situation here why I had to go wireless. But if you don't mind wires everywhere and you like that look, go for wired. It's cheaper and faster. And plus, Cat 6A is just amazing. You can set up a 10 gig Ethernet setup and be happy. Or even go fiber if you want to just go overkill. As I said about my setup is wireless. Wireless is fine. I'm actually fine with AC1200 now. I wasn't fine when I was using N, which is now the router upstairs, as a bridge. Because, well, as I was saying, I'm in a basement, so the reception down here with crap load of concrete, dirt, and just wacky stuff going on is the N couldn't produce a strong enough signal. Even in here, I was only getting 38 to 45% signal strength with whatever setup I had going. Whether it's my home server that was doing it, or it was an external adapter with a big antenna stuck to it and I was like well this sucks and then AC1200 rolled around I said screw it I'm gonna invest on that and I did and so far I'm pretty damn happy with AC1200 now the upstairs end router is doing just bridge repeat and it's perfect for that it's a D-Link I think it's a 632A with the A port 10100 ports in the back it was a $20 purchase no biggie now the reason I have the router upstairs is I needed extension to have extended Wi-Fi ability because while well, the AC 1200 routers are strong enough to point upstairs but the other reason is my father has a studio in the garage he didn't want to rack up data usage so I set up the old router as an extension now some chipsets play nice with certain settings and some don't now the Aetheros D-Link upstairs hated repeater mode and standard bridge mode which you're not supposed to technically do so I said in repeater bridge with people on the DDWRT forums like that's not supposed to work it's la it's working for the last year and I could tell you you know screw it if it works it works it's not the best situation but there's not a lot of you know collusion out there with Wi-Fi with wireless in mind that I'm using I'm gonna say the first thing you do if you're not experienced with wireless and even if you are this is a pro-life tip here you grab you grab any device 
like an Android or an iPhone, this is an MP3 player that was a phone, besides the point, I put a Wi-Fi survey app on this, or even my main phone, I have it on there, and walk around the place and see what your neighbors are using, what channel, because most of the time they'll use channel 6. Normally, channel 6 is your standard configuration channel that everybody is going to have. And I went around here, and I only have four neighbors with Wi-Fi, two that I can you know, physically get on my phone if I'm just sitting right here. And I could see they're both using six. I'm like, well, okay, whatever. And then, you know, I step outside, more sixes. It's like, ugh. And the same thing was when I was out in a steamboat for a local college. I was curious about this motel setup, why it was such shit. Even though I could see the 30 decibel antennas from the room, I'm like, what's, what's the deal here? You know, I just popped out my phone, just turned on the application, and I saw that the all the routers were on channel 6, which is, well, I was like, okay, so the, he got some guy to configure it from Comcast, and he was like, okay, done, whatever. And then I looked outside, you know, I took the phone, walked around, surveyed, and I saw all the businesses were using 6 as well. There was 18 businesses within the vicinity of the motel, and I'm like, are you serious? Are you serious? And I thought to myself, maybe I should talk to these guys and make some money, but I was too busy with doing other nonsense at the local college. Now, as I was saying with serving with wireless, the same goes for wired. You want to survey what's in your walls, know what's in the construction if it's an older building, and that that's the, probably the best route is putting keystone jacks in the wall rather than snake a cord because you could step on the cord, you know, you could pinch it, you can ruin the cable that way, and the cable is bupkis. It'll function. But, say, for example, Linux is going to go, this is not a gigabit cable or a 10 gig cable. I'm not going to give you full speed. Poo. So that's the other thing about surveying. It's not just wireless, it's also wired related. Moving on, let's talk about best practices for your devices. And in that sense, I'm going to talk about IP ranges. You want to stick to, say, a Class C, 192.168.xx. And in that case, you want to just stick to the default one and then X, meaning anything between 2 to 255. And now 1 is going to be omitted because 1 is, of course, going to be your router. That's a given. With that in mind, I prefer to actually set up static IP addresses when I can. With the WRT1200AC, it doesn't let me set IP addresses below the DHCP reser reservation, which is absolutely stupid. Come on, Linksys. Now, now, there is a beta firmware for DDWRT on it, and I don't want to do that yet because I've, I've I've had some luck, but since Marvel is kind of a new chip that only a few routers are using, I'm going to hold on. Now, I don't want to use standard OpenWRT on there, even though it is running it already with a custom... I don't know what it is. It's Web 2.0 garbage with a gradient in the background, big bubbly buttons and clicky nonsense everywhere, and I hate it. But it works. For now, it's fine. As I was saying, static IPs, I prefer to set below my DHCP table. So, say I set my DHCP to 150 to 255 to give a healthy range for any mobile phones floating around, any laptops floating around, or even the TV upstairs. So, that's, that's the idea right there. All my stuff sits below 100. So, between 10 to 100. All my server stuff is on 2 to 10. That's the best practice right there. You want to make a nice, even blocks of what's going where. And that way you can actually figure out what's wrong with something or nothing will collide with that. Because you know, oh, these devices are in this range. These devices are in this range. And with DHCP in mind, you also want to remember this. As I have a router upstairs, if you have two routers or any two network devices that can't physically see each other and do have DHCP... Disable DHCP on your second one if it's on the same subnet. Or set its DHCP reservation range to a block that's not being used. If you can. Otherwise, in my professional experience, I can tell you this. To get rid of any headache, just disable the second DHCP server. And it solves most headaches. Now, I've had friends before wonder why they had a odd situation going on. And I was like, you have two routers on your network? Because, you know, sometimes they tell me ahead of time. And they're like... Yeah. I'm like, your second router, you reset the configuration. They said, yeah. I'm like, your DHCP is enabled in the second one, colliding with the first one. No, 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 no. Ten minutes later, they message me and tell me, oh, it was that. Told you so.
Remember that. Always check that first. Configure your devices separately off the network, meaning connected to a laptop, a computer with a static IP, or anything like that. With NetMask setup, you just want to stick with the default if you're just a beginner or you just want a quick setup, meaning you want to stick with that 255.255.255x. What that means is that only in that last octet you can have devices from 0 to 255. Now if you had say, for example, in my sysadmin setup at the college, I had 255.255.xx. So we had a multiple subnet, multiple IP setup. And that's one situation where you know you have multiple blocks of offices and you want to separate them by subnet, but keep them on the main network, meaning instead of having some crazy setup where you can't see everything or your one device goes cuckoo because you're trying to sign a 192.168.2.50, for example, whatever, just some number at the end, to a DHCP address server that has, you know, it's on a 255.255.255x setup. Now, this is going to the jargon, Terry, just a little bit, just bear with me. Now, with that 2 subnet, if it tries to go on a 1, it's just going to go crazy and not work. Now, that's why you do a 255.255.xx setup. That's just one situation, but in a home, just forget about it. Just leave it default. Just leave it, the, leave it alone. With that little amount of jargon in there, I'm just going to go gloss over and be like, whatever. I'll talk about it in maybe a future video more in depth about all that because it's a little bit convoluted, a little bit complicated if you don't know what's going on there and you're new to that. On the topic of my current setup in this room, it's kind of weird because I have a private network with my home server doing its thing and it has two adapters, a wireless and a wired, and my computer and my laptop and, well, my next build will all be on the wired. Now, this subnet in here sees the external network, but the external network can't see this one for security reasons. It's a weird setup and it works and I'll make a video on the home server about how to set up in Linux, two devices, passing packets between each other and it's a pretty straightforward video and I'll make that as easy as possible as well that anybody can do it because it really isn't difficult. It, it It's one script and a few lines in Linux and boom you're done. If you say it's complex then it's complex but really it's easy. Just you gotta pay attention. The reason I did that is I have a multiple home setup and well, I didn't want, for example, I didn't want this, you know, people's phones interrupting the Wi-Fi signal or some other nonsense and break contact because that thing is connected only on the 5 gigahertz band while the everybody else is on the 2.4. Go figure. I don't call it selfish because, well, they're all using just their cell phones and tablets and low bandwidth devices and upstairs is a N adapter in the TV and it's perfectly fine on the 2.4. Now I needed to have steady connection, no interruptions on this thing. And that's why I have it set up that way in here. That way I have no issues or people actually screwing around with my home server and you know pulling files by accident or something happening. The reason you'd want the setup like I have in here in your home if you live in a multiple person house, whether you live in your parents' house, which is fine, it's 2015, it's nothing new, or you live with multiple roommates and say you, you're doing what I'm doing, you're running a YouTube channel, doing other crazy crap and you don't want your roommates messing with your NAS because you want your storage to be on there because you have multiple devices in your room. For whatever reason, I actually recommend this kind of setup where you have a little private network because well, it works better. Now you could either do the route I didn't have as home server as your NAS as your everything device or you have your own wireless device that connects to the router via a bridge or repeat mode depending on the chipset because some chipsets don't do repeat mode properly and some chipsets do bridge and some do repeater bridge with private networks in mind like I've got in here it's going to segue into a possible future situation I'm going to be in where I'll be on shared land and in my own space but there's going to be a main home and a few cabins for rentals and I was trying to figure out the best way to actually get this all set up what's my cheapest solution here and I was like I'm not gonna do wireless cuz it's gonna be huge multi-acre property and I'm like this is not gonna work and then I looked around and I thought hey there are RG45 to fiber optic extensions and fibers cheap and this is another situation a private network will come in handy is you have say rental cabins on your land that you own and you're thinking what's the best idea to keep the customers happy because I know Wi-Fi sucks in a situation like this and if you ran fiber straight to the homes and you have an RJ45 or 
you know, you post up a little external Wi-Fi device, which I don't want to do. I'm going to route straight RJ45 extenders in each of the cabins and have the fiber optic running there to a main node, you know, in the house with the main connection or route the main connection to my home, whatever it will be, I don't know. But this is another situation a private network will come in handy is that you've got multiple little subnets going on where you as an admin can actually see what's going on. You don't have to walk out there and be poke you with a stick and be like, is it working? Nope. But I digress. That's a future situation where a private network will come in handy is with all that stuff. With this private setup in here out of the way, we're going to move on to the external network and talk about security on that. When you're setting up network security on your wireless device, because that's only a situation you'll set up a security, but if you, even if you're on a wired router, you do have a firewall, so that's best practice right there. But when you're on wireless, now I don't recommend WEP, it's unsecured, it's easily breakable, and I will make a video on how easy it is to break, even though there's millions out there on how it's done. Still fun to do, and I think it'll be fun to document. With WPA2, I use PSK and TKIP as my setup, I mean, mixed security. And with passwords in mind, don't do something silly and easy like your phone number, your street address, or other nonsense. Choose a, you know, on the phone or on the computer, go for password generator and figure something out from there. Or, you know, look around you and try to figure out. A very complex, very strong password, mixing alphanumerical, uppercase and lowercase, and you want to do extra characters like exclamations, asterisks, uh, pluses, minuses, at symbols. Just throw all sorts of crap in there, but make sure you remember it. Now, I don't recommend writing down your passwords on a text paper, but if you live in a situation like I do, I can recommend it because, well, sometimes somebody might forget it. It happens. I'm Max of Max Hacks. If you've liked this video, and want to see more of this kind of stuff, click that little like button down there. And I'll make more like this and keep rambling on and being crazy and goofy and, well, I don't know, just things. Don't forget to subscribe as well, because I see that and that gives me even more motivation to produce more content. Alrighty, Internet.